minutes. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining. Hi everyone, thanks for thanks for joining the Community Borrowers Student Loan Help Clinic. We are gonna get started here in just a few minutes. Wanted to give folks time to sign on. And thanks again so much for joining us this evening. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We will get started in just one, one more minute. All right, everyone, we have almost a full house, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Natalia Abrams. I'm the executive director here at Student Debt Crisis, one of the organizations bringing you this student loan help clinic today. Um, for folks joining us via Zoom, you can use the Q&A function to send us questions. We will be... Uh, having a verbal Q&A periods. We know that some of you are on the phone as well. Um, there is a slide deck associated with this uh, clinic. And so it's off, it is best to see us via Zoom or YouTube. Uh, we do know that there's also an overflow to YouTube. Uh, for folks there, you can send us questions at info, I-N-F-O, at studentdebtcrisis.org. And whether it's on this workshop or afterwards, we will try to get to as many questions as we can. And more importantly, we're here to bring you um, this 
important information, especially with the upcoming payment pause. And we are joined by some really great organizations that are partners to us at Student Debt Crisis. So just wanted to let you know a few uh, housekeeping things. This clinic is part of uh, our new Community Borrowers Project that's brought to you by Student Debt Crisis, experts from Sava Savvy, excuse me, uh, our good partners at Savvy and uh, our allies at Next Gen Policy and a special guest. And thank you for also uh, joining us, people uh, from Young Invincibles. Just important to note, we are not financial counselors or attorneys. We will discuss uh, student loan basics today. We're gonna go over recent policy updates, go over income-driven repayment programs and how and you know who gets public service loan forgiveness and other loan forgiveness programs. Uh, we also uh, are really excited to share an online tool that can help you uh, understand the best option for your specific case, a more one -on, uh, definitely a more one-on-one -on -one touch and enroll you in those programs. And that's you know critically important with the October 1st payment pause looming as of right now. So today, as I mentioned, we're joined by our organization, Student Debt Crisis. Uh, we are also joined by uh, Next Gen Policy, a great partner of ours, Young Invincibles, and the folks at Savvy that have provided this uh, really great tool that we're excited for you to see at the end of this workshop. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Sa Samantha Singh uh, with Next Gen Policy. Samantha, do I have you? Yeah. Hi, Natalia. And thanks, everyone. Um, Happy to be here with all of our partners, Sam Sang with Next Gen Policy. And so let's just jump right into it. Um, so first we do wanna to start today's workshop with uh, recognizing that student loan debt is a significant burden. Um, and unfortunately, fortunately, you're not alone. So on average, um, student debt per person is 37,172. There's about 45 million of us with student loan debt in America and that totals to $1.7 trillion nationwide. We also know on the next slide that um, the, the burden is not uh, carried equally amongst everyone. It's uh, widespread and crosses into many different communities as well. So older borrowers are the fastest, 55-year-old uh, and older are the fastest growing group of borrowers. Um, this impacts women and people of color who disproportionately carry the debt and over 70% of recent graduates do carry debt as well. Um, and on the next slide, we know that the burden of student loan debt has a domino effect. Um, and it's not just an issue about debt, a lot of times, you know, overwhelming debt, but this is an economic crisis, a civil rights issue and has bigger societal impacts. Um, with this kind of debt struggling from uh, with the day-to-day -day living expenses. So it does have a negative impact on wealth. On average, 30-year-old borrowers uh, have $8,000 less in wealth because of student debt. It does uh, impact and prevent home ownership. More than half of first-time home buyers cite student debt as a barrier. And um, it puts folks on financial thin ice. So Black and Latinx people are more prone to unemployment, especially during times of crisis. And so today we're gonna go over first kind of the basics of uh, student loans. Uh, you'll get to hear some policy updates, especially what's been in the headlines recently. Uh, how to repay your loans, we'll go over federal loan forgiveness, um, and definitely get you to that very helpful tool um, from Savvy. Oops. Oops, sorry, does, okay, going on to the next slide. Um, Oh, sorry. So we're going to go over the basics of student loans now. And so there are definitely two types of loans that you should be aware of. Um, there are federal loans, and those details can be found at studentaid.gov. There's fixed interest rates with those loans, and there's lots of other options, repayment plans, hardship deferment, loan forgiveness programs, 
default and default rehabilitation. Um, on the other hand, you do have private loans and those details can be found on your credit report or by contacting the lender. Um, these loans do come with variable interest rates. There's no guaranteed repayment plans, no guaranteed hardship deferment, and no default rehabilitation. There are also three types of federal loans. So you can have a direct loan, Perkins, or federal family education loans, or FEL. Direct loans are given by the government in which money is uh, funded by the government as well. Nearly all federal student loans are direct loans and they qualify for the most repayment programs and loan forgiveness options. Perkins loans are the a type of federal loans that you are awarded by your university or education institution. Um, and then those family, a federal family education loans or FEL are what most older federal loans were and they were given by the government, but the money came from private banks. So if you have one of these older loans, you do qualify for some, but fewer federal programs. And keep in mind, you may have a mix of all of these loans. Uh, a good place to start to see kind of what's on your account is to go to studentaid.gov. Um, it's a good place to check to see the status of your loans um, and to make sure that uh, you have a federal loan, it will show up on that website. It's a good starting place to, to get a handle on uh, where to start with your student loan debt. Um, and it's totally all too common that many borrowers have a mix of federal and private loans. So on the screen, there's uh, some names and logos to help you recognize if you have a federal or private student loan servicer. Um, so please note that some servicers are also both federal and private loan uh, uh, servicers like Navient, so we have them on both sides here of the screen, um, but federal servicers, Molina, Nelnet, Great Lakes, private servicers are like by Discover, Sally Mae. Um, and again, so to find federal uh, information about your federal loans, do you start at studentaid.gov um, to access the federal loan debt database. You can also speak with your student loan servicer company and you can find um, more information online about your federal loans. If you have paperwork that's coming from another company and it doesn't show up here at your studentaid.gov account, chances are that that is probably a private student loan. Um, and make sure you are going to studentaid.gov, that's .gov, as there's many websites out there that try to imitate the federal website and gain access to your personal information. And then just a note about how to find information on your private loans. Uh, okay, so if, again, if it's if the loan information is not showing up at studentaid.gov, it's a probably a good sign. It's a private loan. Um, most private loans do require a cosigner, while federal loans do not. So if you have a cosigner, that's a good sign again that you have private loans, and you can review your credit report to confirm your loans are all loan uh, loans are there. And the most, unfortunately, the most or the best way to get update information on your private student loan and to stay on top of that account is by directly contacting your lender, servicer, or debt collector directly. And so that concludes the basics on student loans. We'll be moving on to the next section of today's workshop on policy updates from uh, Cody Hunanian from Student Debt Crisis. Cody, are you on? I am. Thank you so much, Samantha. That was great. Um, so my name is Cody Hunanian. I am the program director here at Student Debt Crisis. Uh, and like all of you on today's call, I am also a student loan borrower. So this information is was critically important to me. Now I consider myself a bit of an expert on it. And I hope that we can you know, pass them on to you all as well, because the stuff we're about to cover is really powerful. Uh, before we jump into uh, your rights and options as student loan borrowers, I want to cover uh, just some of the updates that you may have uh, bumped into over the last few weeks and months, a lot of it around COVID relief. So here on the next slide, um, I wanted to cover just the basics of COVID relief for borrowers who are currently in repayment. 
So if you have a federally held student loan, that means you have a federal student loan in which the Department of Education owns directly. So that is all of the direct loans that exist. Some of the federal family education loans, those older FFEL loans, uh, but only some of those. Those qualify for uh, suspended payment and interest throughout the pandemic. This started in March of 2020. It was automatic for student loan borrowers who qualified. And it's been extended several times. Right now, the last date for this relief is September 30th. It could be extended again, but all that we know right now is that we wanna prepare borrowers to begin repayment on October 1st. Uh, for those of you that are working in public service, which we're gonna talk about shortly, uh, these payments, well, excuse me, these months that you have not had to make payments count towards progress that you needed to make in that program. Similarly, the default rehabilitation program, which helps people who fall behind on their loans, that has a minimum payment requirement. The months that we were all on pause uh, counts for that as well. So people have been making progress in their programs, even though they haven't been making payments during the pandemic. Now there's other relief for borrowers who were in default. These are people that are uh, significantly behind on their loans. So those borrowers face a lot of consequences and those can include having your tax and social security uh, benefits withheld by the government. That's been on pause since March of 2020. Uh, employers have been instructed to stop wage garnishments. So many borrowers who are, def are in default to have their wages garnished to pay back their loans, that's been on pause. And if your employer has failed to do so, you can even request a refund from the Department of Education. And lastly, if you've been in default, uh, you're going to see, or you should have seen already that since March of 2020, they have not been doing normal debt collection activities like harassing phone calls, letters uh, in the mail, and all of the other things that come with debt collection of federal student loans. Now, I, I slightly touched on it, but only some people have received this COVID-19 relief. And what, depend, what determines that is what type of student loan you have. So if you have a federal direct loan or another type of federal loan that is, quote, federally held, Again, that means that it's owned by the Department of Education, then you qualify. There were other types of loans that were federal loans that you got from the government, but were owned by commercial banks. These are what we call commercially held FFEL and Perkins loans. These were up until just recently excluded from all of the COVID-19 relief. Just recently, there was a minor change that let commercially held FFEL loans have interest and debt collection paused, but payments are still resuming. So there's a lot of different things going on here, uh, depending on what type of student loan you have. And then lastly, private student loans have not received any of the COVID relief that was defined by law at the federal level. So people with private student loans may have particular relief offered by their company, but nothing that's written into law. Now, just briefly, I wanna to touch on the timeline so you all can kind of make sense of what has been a confusing track. Uh, again, March of 2020, Congress passed the CARES Act, which started all of this relief. It was extended by Donald Trump, then extended by President Biden. Now we are at a situation in which payments are set to resume on October 1st. So that's really important for folks to remember because we want you to be able to get into the right repayment program when payments resume. But at the same time, keep aware, you know, stay tuned with the news, follow us at Student Debt Crisis and others because if there is an extension, we will want people to know about it. Um, so we're working towards that. Outside of that, there have been some other recent updates that you may have heard about. There was even an important announcement today in the news. Um, so the Department of Education has committed to canceling over a billion dollars in student loan debt for people who were scammed by for-profit colleges. These are people that have submitted applications for a program called Borrower Defense to Repayment. 
Uh, many of those applications were sitting, particularly over the last four years during the previous administration. They are now going to see relief. Just this morning, the, the administration announced that over um, $250 million in benefits, in, in debt relief, would be given to borrowers who went to the school ITT Tech that was shut down. Uh, also, we mentioned the uh, pause, payment pause was extended to commercially held uh, loans in default. Um, so there's some benefits if you currently weren't receiving relief. And then um, lastly, the department also secured additional relief for people who are totally and permanently disabled. I've already answered a couple of questions in the Q&A about disability discharge. Um, I'll also open it to the group shortly, but there are benefits for you if you're somebody who's totally and permanently disabled. So those are the updates. There's a lot happening right now in the space of student loans. So I know it, it can feel a little overwhelming. We'll always do our best to kind of distill it and communicate it in a way that makes sense for you all. But what is most important uh, beyond all the rapidly changing policies is making sure that you know what your repayment options are. And that's what we're gonna dive into now. We're gonna talk about the different repayment programs that exist for student loans. So let's start here with the 10 year standard repayment plan. If you're a borrower and you just left your program, either you graduated or you stopped going to school, whatever it may be, you're going to have what's called a six month grace period on your federal student loans. So you don't have to make any payments for six months. Once your payments resume, you're gonna be put into what is called the 10 year standard repayment. So for federal student loans, the basic plan that people start off with is a program in which you have 10 years of monthly payments. Each month, they're exactly the same amount and they're fixed, you know, fixed payments each month. At the end of 10 years, you will have paid off the entirety of your loans. That is great if you can afford it. We encourage people, if you can afford your monthly payments as is, you should do it. Uh, I know that most of us on the line here want to pay back our loans, but it doesn't work for everyone. And so there are more affordable repayment options for those of us that are struggling to pay back our loans. The most effective of these options that borrowers have is what we call income-driven repayment. There is a host of income-driven repayment plan options that base your monthly payments as a percentage of your income and your family size. So instead of taking your student loans and dividing them up per month and basing your monthly payment on your total loan amount, which can be huge for those of us that have a lot of student debt, instead, it's gonna be based on what your income is and what your family size is. And the government thinks that that is a better indication of what you can afford each month. So who benefits from these programs? Uh, if you're facing a situation where you're gonna have a consistently lower income, you know, an income that, you, that doesn't allow you to afford your monthly payment, then this program's great for you because you can stay in this program every year. Uh, if you've lost a job or you've had decreased hours in your income due to the COVID-19 pandemic, you can enroll in one of these programs. Uh, if you want to lock in a lower payment right now, just to have it locked in for the next year, you can go ahead and do that, even if you aren't making payments because of the COVID-19 relief. And obviously, if you're one of those borrowers that hadn't received relief at all, you could right now enroll in one of these programs and lower your monthly payments if you qualify. Um, so these are super powerful programs and a lot of us can benefit from it, but we just don't know about the program. So that's what we're here to talk about today. Now, unfortunately, leave it up to the government to create um, several programs with different qualifying factors and a little bit of a messy situation that makes it hard for borrowers to understand their options. We're not gonna get into all the specifics, but I'm listing them here for you on the slide deck. There's revised pay as you earn, pay as you earn, income-based repayment, and an older program called income contingent repayment. Uh, at the top here are the newer programs. Those are the most generous. They've gotten better over years. But because we're not, we don't have time to get into the details, 
Um, you know, pay attention later in the presentation. We're going to talk about the savvy tool. Uh, they can help you look at these programs and see which one works best for you. So here we've got an example of these programs because I think it helps for people to see them in action. So a borrower who has a single, has one child, and has a student loan debt total of $37,000 would, under the standard repayment plan, pay $364 a month. Now on the right here, you can see that in one of these income-driven repayment plans, if your income is $0 or very little, you could pay as little as $0 per month, and that is considered in good standing, that you're still um, according to your records, you know, making payments, even though you're not necessarily doing so. Uh, if you have an income at $25,000, you'd still see significant savings at a monthly payment of $49 per month. And you can see there, even at fifty dollars and $75,000 in income, yearly income, you would still save on your monthly payments. So these programs can be huge for someone who needs to be able to pay their other bills, needs to lighten the load every month so that they can you know, afford to live. We, we understand that student loans are, take out a huge chunk of people's, um, you know, just their income. So you just have to apply for these programs. That's the beauty of it. If you have a federal student loan, these options are your right. You have the ability to apply for them for free at the the Department of Education. You can also contact your loan servicer. But we know as advocates over the years that borrowers have trouble navigating the Department of Education's website. They have problems uh, and are misled by their loan servicing company. And so that's exactly why we've brought on you know, partners that have created technologies to help you. But here are the simple steps. You, step one, you submit an application. It doesn't take very long. It's just some basic information about your income and your student loans, and you can apply. Uh, after 30 to 60 days, you will be put in your new repayment plan, and you'll now have your lower monthly payment. Now, what's really important here is step three. After you're in a repayment plan, you have to recertify your income every year to make sure that you stay in the program and to keep your monthly payment down. So we always tell people, once you get into your repayment plan, put it on the calendar, make sure that you know what your deadline is and that you apply before your deadline. If you miss the deadline, you can still re-enter the program, but you might see that your interest, the accrued interest is added to your principal balance. Your monthly payments will go up in between. Um, it can create a mess. So we want folks to really be on top of this. And I should take this opportunity to note as well that a borrower can recertify their income at any time. So you could recertify in 12 months as is required, but if you lost your job, your income is reduced, you, you're on lower, you have less hours at work, you can recertify to adjust your monthly payment anytime during that 12 months. So, one thing that's come up recently, uh, and it's really picking up steam as we get closer and closer to October 1st, are what we call debt relief scams. So, you know, student debt crisis, we host these workshops where we consider ourselves a nonprofit that is a trusted source that people reach out to. We bring on partners like Next Gen Policy, and we, we partner up with, with tech companies like Savvy to provide these, these resources. But there are for-profit companies out there that are what we would consider a debt relief scam. And that is because they mislead and lie to borrowers and then they charge a huge fee to do pretty much nothing. So these scams will often offer a borrower to uh, immediate loan forgiveness or will offer a loan consolidation in exchange for a, a large upfront fee. And in fact, our research shows that a borrower on average pays $600 for these fees. Uh, you'll likely hear from them in a really urgent tone. They're saying immediate loan forgiveness or deadline approaching. That is almost never the case. There's very few situations where a deadline is approaching and you have to act immediately. This is how they pressure people into using their services. 
And lastly, some of the red flags, if, if they want an upfront fee before they've done anything, if they lie and say they're the Department of Education, that is illegal. And promising loan forgiveness is another area. Folks can help you apply for loan forgiveness, but if a company says, we're gonna forgive your loans tomorrow, you just may wanna be cautious. Now, I wish we could dive into this element more, but it, it's just too much to cover on today's workshop. But I know there's many of you on today's call that uh, are in default. You're, you're so behind on your student loans that you're now um, in collections or you've been denied access to federal financial aid, um, or maybe you have a ton of fees added to your account. For federal student loans in default, you do have options to get out. So first, let's just clarify, if you're a day late on your monthly payments on a federal student loan, you're, you're in delinquency is how we would call that, but nothing really permanent's happened yet. You're not in default. Um, nothing bad permanently is going to be, be done to your account. At 90 days, you're seriously past due. Uh, that's reported to your credit bureau. That can have you know, consequences when it comes to credit reports and financing in the future. But it's that 270 day past due window that you want to avoid because that's when you're in default. If you fall into default, there are a ton of consequences. As I mentioned, there is a program offered to federal student loans. It is called default loan rehabilitation. And again, we're, we don't have time to get into the details here, but it offers borrowers an option to make very low monthly payments for nine months and to return their loans to good standing pretty much erasing all of the consequences of that initial default. So I just bring it up today because I want you to be aware of it. We're not going to dive into the details, but it does exist and you should know about it. Similarly, a borrower, if they contact their loan servicer or go to the Department of Ed, they may see that there are other options we didn't talk about today. There's extended repayment. There's a graduated repayment plan. Your loan servicer may try to push you into forbearance or deferment. These are all other repayment options that exist. They could be helpful to borrowers if they have short-term situations or if they um, are in particular circumstances. But just speaking broadly, these other alternative options are not nearly as helpful for struggling borrowers as the income-driven repayment plans. And yet their student loan companies will also often push them into these other options. So we're not gonna cover them, but I want you to know that they exist because you may find yourself in a situation where your loan company is telling you to enroll in one of these programs. And it might be that these income driven repayment plans are better for your situation. So just be aware that these options exist. So, we're going to just provide another checklist here just to help you kind of summarize. If you're interested in one of these repayment plans, uh, learn what plan works best for you. It's always helpful to be empowered with information. And you can do so by visiting studentaid.gov. You could contact your loan servicer, but you're likely going to get, you know, possibly problematic information. Or you can use the tool that our friends at Savvy have created they'll help you compare and contrast all the programs and really kind of highlight the program that works best for you. Uh, submit that IDR application, your income-driven repayment plan application. It's online. Our friends at Savvy can help you apply for it. Whatever you need to get that application in, you know, be sure to do that. And then put it on the calendar to recertify your income next year to stay in the programs. That's really key here. So with that, I think we'll pause for a second and address some of the questions. I know there's been a lot that have been coming through the Q&A window, and that's what we're here to do is answer your questions. Um, so let's see here. I've already got a couple here that were really interesting to me. Um, what, is a, what about a borrower that has uh, both federal both federal and private student loans. Is there anything that they can do to make their, uh, to combine their student loans if they have a private and a federal student loan? Because this borrower tells us they're struggling 
to afford their private student loans because they haven't received any relief. Um, I can jump in here, Cody. This is Spencer. I'll be talking in a second on the forgiveness programs. Um, technically speaking, yes, you can combine them, um, but there's only it only works in one direction. Um, you can only turn federal loans into private loans through a process called refinancing. You cannot turn private loans into federal loans. Um, generally speaking, private loans lack much of the consumer protections and they certainly lack any prospect of forgiveness that federal loans have. Uh, we're not gonna really be talking at all about refinancing here tonight um, because of some of those, um, the, the problems that exist there. Um, if you have both, um, what's great about the Savvy tool that uh, we'll be demoing tonight is you can find different um, repayment strategies for private loans versus federal loans. Um, you know, you may have a different strategy based off of which kind of loan you have. Um, but, but broadly speaking, would just kind of caution that folks um, do not uh, refinance their federal loans without really thinking about it, because once you do that, it is irreversible. And you are in many ways signing away your consumer protections uh, and that prospect for forgiveness. Um, another question came from someone who was uh, a current student, which I'm always really excited about. Um, so Sebastian asked, is it wise to start making student loan payments while you're still in school and before you're really required to make payments? Um, I can jump in again. Um, I, I think I answered this one uh, in writing. Um, you're not required to make payments um, while you are in school, uh, as long as they are federal loans. Um, private loans have different um, requirements, uh, but for federal loans, you are not required to make um, payments, uh, but interest does accrue um, on unsubsidized loans. Um, and there is also a grace period of uh, typically six months after you graduate uh, until you have to start repayment. Um, so again, you're not required to make payments in school. Um, you, you could if you wanted to, but there's, um, that's kind of up to your financial situation and, and whether that makes sense to save a little bit on the interest. I've got a question here from uh, Leah, and Leah wanted to know, how do we recertify our income for an IDR program? Like, what does that mean exactly? And I'm happy to, to address that one since I was talking about IDR programs. Uh, but Leah, um, when we talk about recertifying your income, there is this online application for an income-driven repayment plan. And um, when I say recertify, you just fill out this form every year uh, with some basic income information. And in fact, for many borrowers, you can automatically have your, your, your information based on the IRS information from your income uh, submitted into your form. And when you do that, your monthly payment is just adjusted. So if your income goes up, your monthly payment on your student loans may go up. And if your payment goes down, uh, it may go down as well. Um, now, I know there's also some folks that have like peculiar, peculiar, excuse me, uh, somewhat abnormal um, like payment structures with their work. Um, I don't know if, if anyone at the Savvy team wants to jump in there because there are some alternative ways of proving your income uh, if you're in kind of a unique circumstance. Um, I can jump in. Um, I, for, for unique um, income circumstances, there are other options to prove income. Um, I believe in, including, you know, pay stubs or any sort of um, proof of, of income or payment. Um, and all of those uh, income verification options, um, Savvy can help you with um, during that process. Great. 
Um, I've got one more question we'll do in this section, then we'll jump into the next. And we'll, of course, take more questions as we go along. Um, but uh, another borrower wanted to know uh, if you have an older federal family education loan, is there anything you can do to retroactively go back and get some of the benefits, uh, the COVID relief that you had missed over this last year? Um, hey, Cody. Spencer. Oh, go ahead, Spencer. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, there is no way to go back and get retroactive relief. Um, but if you do go through a process called um, federal consolidation, which is different than that refinancing that I was talking about earlier, um, consolidation is where you really start over by creating a new loan by combining your existing federal loans. And all uh, new consolidation loans through the, the federal government are all going to be direct, direct loans. So if you do go through that process, um, you will start getting some of that relief once you finish the consolidation process. But um, unfortunately, there's no way to go back and get that retroactive relief if you have um, commercially held FFEL loans. Great. So with that, I want to keep the presentation going. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Spencer because he's going to talk about loan forgiveness programs, but I'm encouraging folks continue to put your questions into the window. We're going to get to as many as we can, both in the chat and also we'll talk about more as we get through today's presentation. Thank you, Cody. Um, again, this is Spencer Dixon um, from the Savvy team. Thank you all so much for, for being on tonight. Um, so I will be talking about um, the federal loan forgiveness programs, um, what they are, what the application process is, and then some additional information and next steps on how to take advantage of them. The first program I'll be talking about is teacher loan forgiveness. As the name suggests, this program is specifically for teachers, um, people who are actually teaching in the classroom uh, in a full-time capacity. Um, you have to be what's called a highly qualified teacher. Uh, for those that are educators, uh, you know, you likely know what that means. Uh, that is a specific classification. And there's different tiers. Um, so you can get 5,000 in forgiveness if you are working in a low-income school or educational agency uh, that's an elementary or secondary school. Um, there is a specific list of which schools are actually count as low-income schools. Um, thankfully, Savvy will help you determine if you're working or if you've worked for one of those schools in the past, so you don't have to worry about that. You can get up to 17,500 in forgiveness um, if you are working in math, science, and special education. So there's, there's a higher amount of forgiveness for those specific um, subjects, uh, their, their higher need areas. Uh, and that is only for secondary school or, or high school. Um, so teacher loan forgiveness, it is a specific amount um, that you will get in forgiveness, either 5,000 or 17,500. And it does have some of those specific um, eligibility requirements. If, if you don't fit what you see on the screen there, um, you're, you likely don't qualify for that. But there are other options, including the public service loan forgiveness program, which I will talk about next. So the public service loan forgiveness, uh, the good, bad, and the ugly. I'm sure you've heard about it. I'm sure you've read about it. Um, you know, the, the promise that exists and perhaps some of its shortcomings. Um, and we'll be talking about how to avoid those shortcomings today. So the program started um, on October 1st of 2007. Um, that date is important because um, you're only gonna have any um, credits count, you're only going to have any of your, your employment count on that date or after. So anything before then does not count towards this program. In order to get forgiveness, you have to make 120 qualifying payments, which the shortest that that could happen would be 10 years, 10 years times 12 months a year. Uh, those qualifying payments, I'll talk more in depth in a second, but you're, it's basically working for the right employer 
and making uh, payments on the, the right kind of loans that qualify. Once you've done that, all of your remaining uh, loan balance will be forgiven tax-free. No matter the balance, uh, that will be forgiven tax-free once you've met those eligibility requirements, which I will talk about in more detail uh, in a bit. The key to public service loan forgiveness and, and really unlocking the benefit is combining uh, your enrollment in an income-driven repayment plan that Cody talked about earlier, um, and then you know getting that forgiveness. The way that the public service loan forgiveness program works is it does require you to make payments along the way, but you want those payments to be as low as possible because you are deferring as much of your loan balance as possible to be forgiven at the end of that uh, 120 qualifying payment cycle. Um, folks who graduate, you know, once your grace period ends, you're going to be put into the standard plan, as Cody talked about. That's the default plan. The That plan is, is designed to pay off your loan in 10 years. The Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program requires you to make 10 years at least of payments. So there is almost no way for folks to benefit from the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program without switching out of the standard plan, getting into an income-driven repayment plan, lowering your monthly payment, and deferring as much of that balance as possible to the end and getting it forgiven. So next, I'll talk about the basics of the program. So it we kind of think about it as a journey. Um, the first, in many ways, most fundamental question is do you have a direct loan? Um, as Sam talked about earlier, a direct loan is a loan that was made, as the, as the name suggests, directly by the Department of Education. It's owned by the government and it was issued by the government. These loans um, really only just started right around when the when PSLF uh, began in the, in the late 2000s. Um, but they didn't even become the predominant and, and the, the only loan type until around 2010, 2011. So uh, for many years, you had folks who were getting loans that weren't direct loans, even while the public service loan forgiveness program had been established. Um, so it's critically important um, that you have a direct loan in order to qualify for this program. Next, does your employment qualify? I'll talk about what does and does not qualify uh, in a second, but mainly it's working for a nonprofit or working in the public sector. Next, are you on a qualifying repayment plan? Um, that is going to be an income-driven repayment plan where you're really going to get that benefit. Technically speaking, payments made under the standard plan do count, but mathematically speaking, you're not going to really enjoy the benefits of the program if you remain in the standard plan. Um, then you need to document your employment using the PSLF form. Um, as of a few months ago, the PSLF form has been consolidated into one form. Um, so you're going to fill that out to actually document your employment. What's a little funny about that is you're, you will really submit maybe up to 10 of those forms over the, the course of this process. And you're not really applying for the forgiveness until you've actually met the 120 credit barrier, um, you know, which is what we have here at the end. You're actually applying for that forgiveness once, you, once you've made uh, 120 qualifying payments. So next I'll talk about specifically what does qualify for this program. So loans, as I mentioned earlier, um, direct loans are, are what qualifies. Um, and there are, you know, a couple things to consider, um, but it's, you know, the unsubsidized loans, uh, graduate plus loans, um, direct parent plus loans do qualify, but you have to go through a separate sp uh, step of consolidation in order to actually unlock the eligibility for that particular program. Um, employers, as I mentioned, is all levels of government. If you get your paycheck from uh, the, you know, whether it's a state, local, federal government, if you're a teacher, firefighter, librarian, you're a civil service person, that's gonna qualify. 
as well as uh, folks who work in the nonprofit sector, specifically 501c3 nonprofits, which is a specific distinction. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, you have to be in a repayment plan that is either an income-driven repayment plan, which is where you're going to get that, that um, benefit from. Um, the 10-year standard repayment plan is a qualifier. You know, those credits will count, but you're not going to really get that forgiveness if you remain in that program. So next, what doesn't qualify? Loans that are the older FFEL loans. Perkins loans, any loan that's in default is not going to qualify, and any private loan is not going to qualify. Some of the nuance here for employers, um, government contractors do not qualify because you're not getting your paycheck directly from the federal government or, or any government. Labor unions do not qualify. Um, neither do nonprofits that are um, more politically affiliated, um, 501c4 or other political groups. Um, repayment plans that do not qualify for the traditional public service loan forgiveness program, the extended graduated, the extended graduated program, or any time spent in deferment, default, or for um, deferment, forbearance, or default. The big exception there on that last point is the current COVID forbearance, which does count as long as you are meeting the other um, aspects of the eligibility. Uh, which is a great segue here to, to the next point. Um, you know, the, the time spent in COVID forbearance um, does count towards those credits that you need to accumulate uh, from March of last year through the end of September of this year is going to be 19 out of the 120 credits, which isn't nothing. It's going to represent about one sixth of your total uh, 120 payments that you need. And you don't have to make any uh, payments on those loans in order to, to get those credits. And in fact, um, really, there's no benefit in paying your loans right now. Um, because interest is at zero, and it's not accumulating, um, there is really no benefit in making payments on your loans that are owned by the government. If your servicer tells you that you owe something, it's probably because you have those other loans and you still need to be making those payments. Um, Overall, the savvy tool will help you uh, ensure that you take advantage of this, um, this kind of loophole in the system by, you know, dotting your I's and checking your T's, dotting your I's uh, and check and crossing your T's, which uh, my colleague Ian will talk about in a second. Uh, I do want to touch briefly on a program called Temporary Expanded Public Service Loan Forgiveness, TEPSLF. This was a program uh, that Congress created after um, it became clear that many, many borrowers were misled or, or you know, thought that they were on track for PSLF. So Congress did create a loophole, um, but it's only for people who were in the wrong repayment plan, not people who had the wrong loans. Um, so if you were repaying your loans over the years with one of those um, loan types that I talked about earlier, the extended graduated or extended graduated uh, repayment programs, um, you can get, you can have those, um, those payments count as credits, uh, but it's going to be through the TEPSLF program, not the regular program. Um, again, Savvy will determine, you know, which one's best for you, which ones you're going to qualify for and help you actually get that forgiveness. Um, closing things out here, just want to touch on a, a few of the other versions of forgiveness and cancellation that exist. Um, and I know uh, Cody and others have mentioned some of these before. If you have a total and permanent disability, um, which does have a specific um, definition, um, you can learn more about that um, online at, at studentaid.gov. Um, you can have your, your loans discharged. If you went to a school that closed either while you were enrolled or immediately after you were enrolled, you can have your loans discharged in that case. Um, borrower defense to repayment um, is that program that exists to provide relief to borrowers that went to schools that defrauded students. Um, and there are kind of specific cases of what that means if they, you know, they lied about job prospects um, or, or, or other things like that. 
Um, again, you can find more information on that on studentaid.gov as well. Um, there are others uh, that I won't go into great detail. You know, for example, if in the unfortunate event that a borrower dies, um, the student loans um, do not have to be repaid, you know, in the same way that credit card debt would have to be repaid. Um, so closing things out here, just want to go through the checklist of action for forgiveness programs. Um, you need to confirm that you have a qualifying loan, which for PSLF is a direct loan. Um, you have to enroll in a qualifying repayment plan, which is an income-driven repayment plan. You need to verify your employer uh, qualifies and keep documentation of that process, uh, and then continue to make those payments during normal times. Uh, you know, you don't right now because of the COVID forbearance. Um, once you've reached those 120 credits, you actually can apply for that forgiveness. You can do all of these steps by using the savvy tool, um, which my colleague Ian will be talking about next. Um, we will determine what you're eligible for and then actually help you through the enrollment process and all of the kind of annual um, recertifications and, and proving of where you work. All of that is done through the tool with us, with our experts. Um, we are here to take out a lot of this complexity and, and help you navigate um, this labyrinth of programs and actually get folks some real relief. Um, so with that, um, I will turn things over to Ian unless we need to maybe stop for questions. Cody, that's uh, maybe up to you. I think looking at the clock, feel free to just uh, continue. We've got another break for questions and then we'll do some more at the end. Great, Ian, over to you. Great, thank you, Spencer. Um, so everything here, as you can imagine, has been, you know, quite convoluted and confusing, which is the great part about this service is that it does it all for you on your behalf in sorting out what those best options are. Um, so that is the great part about technology is putting that to use for us. Um, if you have not probably heard about Savvy before, we are an organization founded by student loan experts and advocates um, based here in Washington, DC, working alongside um, the advocates at Student Debt Crisis um, and many other partners across the country to help um, you know, end this student debt crisis that we are in. We are a public benefit corporation um, that is, uh, you know, runs and owns a technology solution online here um, that helps, you know, mean the main bread and butter of our service helps lower your monthly payment and get squared away successfully with that student loan forgiveness. Um, as I'm sure you've read in lots of headlines um, in your own experience, it can be very harrowing and very challenging to figure out, you know, what all these words mean, what all the plan options are. Um, having to, you know, kind of battle the federal government on your own um, is not a task anyone would want to take on. Um, so we have a whole team of human experts um, all over the country, all the way from California to Florida to Texas and anywhere in between that are able to help you, you know, on the phone alongside that online service that we're going to walk through now um, that will plug in all the best options for you. You can think of it very similarly to a tax prep software. So if you've used any online services like that, um, similarly, you will just put in a, uh, some personal information um, in just a few minutes and it will show you in return all of the best options for you. Um, so I like to think of it as a map that it builds on your behalf to get you from where you are to where you want to be of the lowest, you know, often the lowest monthly payment um, and achieving loan forgiveness if you are eligible. Um, the service also reminds you annually to make sure that all the paperwork is submitted. As Spencer had said earlier, there is um, a ton of federal paperwork that needs to be handled every year. Um, so as a reminder to do that. Uh, it also does it all digitally for you, 100% online. If this is something you know you're to be doing on your own and kind of you know going up against the federal Department of Education, um, you would have to you know download them, print them, fill it out with pen and paper, um, and then fax them back in. Um, and that you know just alone right there is why a majority of people are denied and and don't see um, their intended goals through of getting that actual loan forgiveness or getting their um, monthly payment to a doable amount. Um, additionally, there's other features here, uh, such as, like I said, that team of student loan experts 
that are happy to help um, throughout this whole process, answer any questions, any unique um, situations. As I know, everyone's student loan situation is um, very different. Um, to get started with this service, if you're thinking, wow, this sounds too good to be true, it's not this time, um, you can get started and register for free um, on behalf of our partners at uh, Young Invincibles and um, Next Gen Policy and Student Debt Crisis. They've made this service available to you um, for no cost. That is um, That link is in the chat box, but it is also at app.bysavvy bysavi.com slash register slash borrowers. We'll make a free account here. It will always be 100% free to you. It's, it's just a first name, last name, email, and password. It is nothing that you ever get marketed to or anything sold or anything like that. It is just for security since we're going to be putting some important information together here today. Um, once you make that account, you will be put into your dashboard. You can think of this as a control center for your student loans. So you'll be able to see all of your loans once you put them in all in one spot. It will, um, as you can see here on the progress bar, show you where your application is at along its journey. Um, so you'll always know what the status is. You'll be able to join future events um, such as this one and always be able to contact an expert at any point in time. To get started, we need to push the big red orange button um, red, orange, I'm sorry, orange button um, at the top of the screen that says continue or start application. Um, once we click that is where it will maybe look, you know, more familiar, uh, like a tax prep software of just asking question by question. So you'll be able to see here, um, there are just a few questions along the side, things like what state you live in, how many children you have, um, what your uh, annual salary is. All of this information might feel weird to put in for your student loans, but I promise it always helps to save you money. For example, um, as Spencer was saying earlier, every child dependent that you have is $50 that you save um, every month on an income driven repayment plan because it takes into consideration that family size. Um, so those are great things that we are always looking to try and you know claim that deduction and claim that savings for you. We'll go through um, and it will track the progress all the way through of just answering those simple questions. Um, and we'll give you a live estimate throughout the whole process. Um, once we get to one of the last steps here, finally, of you know, getting enough of the nitty gritty information, we're gonna go ahead and put our student loans in. The best way to do this would be just to hit the sync loans button that pops up. Um, we use a service called Plaid. Plaid is leading um, industry security technology that draws a secure connection between uh, the companies that you would pay your monthly um, student loan to every month, such as Navient, FedLoan, Nelnet, those kind of familiar names that we might all know. It takes that account, you know, that actually holds the loan and just syncs it to us so that we can see a snapshot of what's going on. This is how we're able to best help to see, you know, what was the original amount? What is left owed? What's the interest rate? How many credits towards loan forgiveness might we already have, um, you know, added up and collected? Uh, so all of that information is gathered quickly and securely that way. Once we do that process of syncing our loans into the tool is when it is um, giving us this really cool map. So it gives us all of our options. The next screen, please. Um, that shows all of the results of that. So you can see here based on the information that we've entered in this example, uh, it shows us that we are eligible for forgiveness, have lowered our monthly payment by $255 using one of those income-driven repayment plans. So that uh, you know monthly payment is now only $122 in this example and has about $25,000 of loan forgiveness um, that is estimated. Um, you'll see here that this is happening via the pay plan, which is an income-driven plan and public service loan forgiveness. So it details all of this for you and you can see it, it gives you four other options. So you can always pick what is best for you, even though this is the recommended one. By hitting select plan, it will um, then start and you know, forward you into filling out the paperwork um, online, all digitally, putting your name and address and any of that details in and sends it right off to your student loan servicer. If at any way along this point, um, you know, it's been, you know, 
too easy, uh, it feels right to just have that. Um, there is always a contact support option. Um, they are around to chat live. Uh, oftentimes, if you're uh, working in the tool uh, during the day, you'll be able to chat with someone right away instantly. Otherwise, you can send us an email, schedule a phone call, or visit the help center um, to answer any of your questions. Um, and we will have one of our team of student loan experts um, get back to you uh, quickly. Back to you to take questions. Great, thank you so much, Ian. Um, you know, I, I can't stress enough how important it is that borrowers just get the basic information they need to enroll in these programs. Um, and again, you know, we've brought our partners here from Savvy and other allies in the movement to help connect you with this information and make sure you can apply to take advantage of your rights. Um, so I'm just really appreciative. So thank you for that, Ian. All right, so we're going to take a few more questions here. Then we're going to jump into a little bit about advocacy before we wrap up and end with the final Q&A section. Um, but I got some great questions I want to address uh, right now. Um, one borrower on today's call was asking, um, do we think that interest rates on federal student loans are going to go down? Maybe even no interest rates on federal student loans. Uh, this, is pers this is someone who's really concerned that debt cancellation or permanent relief won't happen, but maybe they, maybe, just maybe they could have their interest reduced. Um, is there anyone on today's call that's kind of following the progress going on when it comes to lower interest rates on student loans? I can jump in, this is Spencer. Um, yeah, so, you know, we've obviously been in the COVID forbearance since March of last year with zero interest. Uh, and we are planning at least right now uh, for that interest and the, and the payments to start coming due again um, after September 30th. Um, it is possible that, um, you know, the administration could decide to turn on payments, but keep interest at zero. Um, we haven't seen that discussed a lot. So, um, that would be a bit surprising. Um, otherwise those, the interest rates will return to what they were, uh, you know, in February or so of 2020. Um, and then for new borrowers, like if you're a student here and, and you're, or you plan to, to be a student in the future uh, and you plan to take out more federal student loans, um, the, the federal student loan interest rates are actually tied to, you know, whatever the, the main interest rate is for the government. Um, and right now they're really low, but in the future, you know, they could be higher. So those will change and, you know, in the next, let's say, two, three, four years, it's likely that they will be higher. To be clear, that only is for future, that, that's only for loans that will be um, applied for in the future. If you currently have a federal student loan, all federal student loan interest rates are fixed. Whatever your interest rate is, or whatever it was, let's say back in February of 2020, that's what it will always be, uh, as long as it's a federal loan. So, um, it, you know, to, I guess to answer your question, it's hard to say, um, but right now we're operating under the assumption that um, in October, November of this year, interest rates uh, for federal student loans will return to what they were before the pandemic. Great. Um, thank you for that, Spencer. Um, obviously, interest rates for many of us are things, uh, is something that has been really important for years. It's hasn't been discussed as much as it probably should have should be in the most recent uh, months and years, uh, but there's still a lot to be discussed there. So thanks for covering that. Um, all right, more questions here. Uh, another person wanted to know about loan forgiveness for those that are in an income-driven repayment plan. Uh, and I didn't really get into that too much. So if anyone uh, on, on the call can just clarify for those that want to know if you're in an IDR program for decades, what happens at the end? I can jump in again. Um, so, um, you know, we, I talked about the public service loan forgiveness program and I talked about the 120 credits, which at the very shortest, it could be 10 years. Um, if you are not 
in, um, you know, if you're not working for a nonprofit or the public sector, or let's say you have some of those older loans that don't qualify for PSLF, um, you could still get some forgiveness. Um, so all income driven repayment plans offer forgiveness at the end of their repayment period. Um, those repayment periods do vary from different plans, um, but they are between 20 and 25 years. With the newer, more generous plans like pay and repay having a shorter uh, repayment window. So regardless of your loan type, as long as you qualify for, for these IDRs, um, you can get forgiveness after 20 to 25 years of repayment, you know, as long as you've been enrolled in those IDRs. Um, What's kind of an interesting development is um, the American Rescue Plan passed a few months ago included a provision that now treats all student loan forgiveness, including forgiveness um, under an IDR outside of PSLF um, as tax-free. It, it used to be that forgiveness through IDRs outside of PSLF uh, had tax implications. You had to pay taxes on, on what was forgiven. Now, at least for the next several years, all student loan forgiveness is treated tax-free. So there are forgiveness options outside of PSLF uh, and IDRs do offer that opportunity. It just requires, you know, a 20 to 25 year repayment versus a 10 year under PSLF. All right. Um, let's see a few questions from PSLF borrowers. Um, and essentially, uh, a few borrowers wanted to know, what if you work in public service, and then you leave your job, maybe you go to the private sector, and then you come back to, to more public service work? Does a disruption in that public service work prevent you from accessing public service loan forgiveness? Um, and I'm happy to jump in on this one. So I, I chatted to these borrowers. The great thing about PSLF, public service loan forgiveness, is that it's cumulative, not consecutive. So what's great about it is that a borrower can, um, can over a long period of time put together 10 years total of work in a qualifying public service job. I know for many of us who work in public service, it is challenging. These are underpaid jobs often. Um, and so people do jump in and out of the, the, the industry. So uh, just keep that in mind. If you work in public service, you can, your 120 monthly payments need to be made cumulatively, but a disruption in your qualifying work does not prevent you from applying in the future. Okay, uh, more questions or some great ones here. Um, Roberto is a police officer and he's about to retire, but before he does so, he wants to make sure that he applies for public service loan forgiveness. Um, so if anyone on the call can just uh, kind of go through the process again of what a borrower needs to check off and what they need to do to apply for public service loan forgiveness. I can take this. Um, well, first, I would just uh, put in another plug for, for Savvy. Um, we, we kind of have that checklist on our end and we make sure that you get through it. Um, one of the, you know, there's lots of reasons why there's been um, problems with the public service loan forgiveness program, but you know, it is a bit complex and we make sure we ensure that uh, you are, you know, dotting all your I's, crossing your T's, making sure that you are meeting all of those um, requirements and getting through that checklist. Um, but overall, you know, if you either want to do it on your own uh, or just for your own awareness, uh, you know, first having a direct loan to um, being in a repayment program and an income driven repayment program, three, working for the right employer in the public sector or a nonprofit, uh, and then four, making 120 on time um, payments while you are working for that employer uh, for at least uh, 30 hours a week or full, full time. Um, so those are the requirements. That's what you kind of need to go through. Um, you do have some documentation. Um, you know, that you need to file along the way to ensure that, that, you know, those credits are actually being counted, which again is where Savvy comes in. And then once you've gotten to that 120, then that's when you formally apply 
and actually have your loans forgiven. All right, I'm gonna take one more question here and then we'll go to the next section. Um, this is a borrower who enrolled, excuse me, they thought they're on track for public service loan forgiveness years ago. They go to apply and they are denied for some reason. Um, what can a borrower do if they feel like they've met all the qualifications and were denied their application? Is there some sort of appeals process or somewhere they can go to, to address that? Um, so the, the servicer that um, is responsible for PSLF is Fed Loan Servicing. Um, I, I believe there are, you know, some um, appeals processes through Fed Loan. Um, however, um, you know, the reason that they deny borrowers, you know, is likely to be one of the um, borrowers weren't meeting one of the eligibility criteria that I just talked about. Um, and again, to kind of, you know, pitch savvy and, and the way that we can help is we can prevent that in the first place. We can say, you know, the, you're, you're missing this one piece, let's fix this and let's get you on the right path so that you can start accumulating these credits now um, so that when you do apply, you will get accepted. Hey, Cody, this is Lindsay. I was just gonna also add on to that. Um, there are some federal channels through which, and, and Savvy utilizes these as well um, to sort of escalate that case. Uh, through the federal ombudsman or the CFPB, you can submit and file complaints. Um, and this has actually been successful from Savvy's perspective in helping borrowers to uh, hear back from Fed loan and, and things like that. So we're happy to help facilitate borrowers who want to pursue those options. Great. Um, cool. Let's move into this next section so we can talk about some ways to to create change, what we're doing to improve the situation here, um, and just talk about taking action in general. Um, I wanna first pass it to uh, Samantha Sang from NextGen, who's doing a lot of the work here in California, which has been really exciting for us. Uh, Samantha, are you still on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Thanks everyone. Um, yeah, and so what's happening in California is really exciting, and uh, we were able to pass together with uh, many of the allies here and many of you probably on the phone or, or tuning in the Student Borrow Bill of Rights uh, last year, and it went into effect January 1st of this year. Um, it's going to be a new law that bans abusive student loan servicing practices that take advantage of borrowers, and the bill created uh, special protections for military borrowers, borrowers working in public service, older borrowers, and people with disabilities. We could not have gotten that through without the help of all of you probably who sent in thousands of phone calls, letters, and tweets. Um, your actions made the difference here in California with our lawmakers and the governor to make them understand what's actually happening for borrowers on the ground. Um, and so this year, we're happy to to continue the fight, um, again, with many of the allies here and hopefully with your help, uh, the coalition is working to do something for private student loan borrowers um, from frivolous loss lawsuits with the new bill, Assembly Bill or AB 424 by Assemblymember Mark Stone. Again, this is just in California um, and the bill would per uh, protect borrowers with private student loans. Um, we've seen and heard um, stories and data that show borrowers are being taken to court and getting wages garnished on loans they may not even owe. So this bill will stop this abusive debt collection practice. And if you wanna learn more, you can visit um, Student Debt Crisis website, our website, nextgenpolicy.org, or californiaborrowers.org and get involved. Um, the bill is halfway through the legislative process. So your support now is definitely needed. You know, we need calls and writing to uh, state senators here in California to continue the fight um, and bring more protections to borrowers um, in the state. And we, again, uh, your voices make all the difference against industry student loan servicers that are talking to these lawmakers as well. So please, please take a look and we appreciate everyone's help and support in, in the fight. And I think I'll pass it back to, or I'll send it over to Natalia. 
Natalia, are you on? Yes, thank you so much, Sam. And thank you for all the work that Next Gen Policy and you are doing in California. And I agree with Sam, we appreciate all of the support uh, from you all on this call. Um, and we know another issue that is incredibly important to you as it is to all of us on the call is the movement to cancel student debt. You know, we have not forgotten about that. We, you know, make sure it's our mission to inform you as borrowers of all of the repayment programs and options out there so you can be in the best possible situation right now. But we are working towards the future and to cancel student debt as soon as we possibly can. We've had hundreds of thousands of you send letters uh, to urge Joe Biden to take action via Congress or sending to Joe Biden himself. Um, uh, 1.3 million have signed a petition to cancel student debt. So we hear you loud and clear. And you know we feel that canceling student debt would one, provide COVID relief for so many borrowers, stimulate the overall economy, and also help to address racial inequities and disparities that exist due to this broken system. In addition, over 415 organizations, nonprofits, faith groups, grassroots uh, organizations and think tanks have urged President Biden to cancel student debt immediately by executive action. That was echoed by Senator Schumer and Warren and uh, Congresswoman Presley in the House. And we have seen major cities also call on Joe Biden to cancel student debt. And we just want to thank you. You know, so many of you have been sharing your voices with us. Uh, about 12,000 or almost 13,000 shared your voices recently on why you wanted to cancel student debt. We encourage you to do that. Uh, you know, we also will be circulating a new COVID survey, which many of you have taken um, this time to see where you're all at today with what's going on with the COVID crisis. Uh, and because on top of canceling student debt, we are also very aware of this October 1st payment pause and are doing everything we can to urge the department and the White House to continue the pause until they actually do something to fix the overall system. Back to you, Cody. Perfect timing. Uh, there's a Good amount of questions. We're going to try to check off as many as we can here before we wrap up today's call. Um, I know it's been a lot of information, so I should encourage people uh, to take advantage of the savvy tool that we've mentioned. Uh, you know, we'll be sharing after the workshop an email that's got the tool that has a recording of the workshop. So we really want to make sure you have the information that you need uh, and can take action after the call um, to improve your situation. So let's see here. Um, there's a question I want to address uh, that's just related to this, this last um, section we just had. Uh, I've seen a couple of people who've um, pretty, much, pretty much said that they're waiting to make choices on their student loans based on the prospect of debt cancellation. So before we jump into any questions, I did want to address those questions because um, we just want people to know that we are fighting. We're part of a broad movement, um, student debt crises, um, and next-gen policy as well, uh, to address some of the issues that impact student loan borrowers. But when it comes to cancellation, that is something that is still on the table. It is a proposal, um, and it's nothing written into law yet. So that means borrowers really have to know these options we've talked about today um, and take advantage of currently existing laws if they're struggling before they consider the prospect of big, bold, transformative change, because we're just, we haven't secured it yet. We're fighting, but it's not there yet. So I wanna address that for the handful of borrowers that I saw make that comment here in the chat box. All right, now back to questions related to the current programs. Um, another borrower here named Patricia wanted uh, clarity again about the income-driven repayment plans. Particularly, they wanted to know about the forgiveness mechanism that happens after 20 or 25 years. Um, so can someone just explain one more time, you know, what does completing an income-driven repayment plan mean and look like? Um, I can jump in on this. Um, so <clears throat> um, the first income-driven repayment plan started 
um, I think in the early 90s, uh, early to mid 90s. Um, and so we, we have not really reached the, the end of that uh, first repayment window. Um, that program, ICR, has a 25-year um, repayment window. We're coming close to that, um, but um, you know, we, we are just on the cusp of, of starting to see some folks be eligible for forgiveness just through IDRs you know, outside of PSLF. Um, and so there's not a lot of, uh, you know, examples of it yet, um, but it should happen. Um, your servicer should, and the, the word carrying a lot of weight there is should, um, have all of this documented and know that you've been making payments, you know, through this program for the n- number of years required. Um, but because, you know, folks aren't really eligible for it yet, I am personally not familiar with kind of a process to formally apply for that forgiveness. Um, I believe it's something that the servicers have to monitor and then, uh, you know, let you know that you've reached that number. And Spencer, um, as of this year, the, you know, forgiveness that you receive is no longer text, correct? That's right. Um, From now through um, the end of 2025. However, um, now that Congress has done that, it's going to, I think, be really hard for them not to extend that. And especially if we as borrowers, you know, put pressure on our, our policymakers to uh, at least keep the, the limited relief that, that's already in place. Um, so yes, it, tax-free forgiveness for all plans, it's technically temporary, but is very likely going to be extended and hopefully made permanent. Okay. Um, now there's more questions here on uh, public service loan forgiveness. Um, this has been a persistent issue, but I do see a borrower here that says, you know, they had heard that nobody was receiving public service loan forgiveness. Um, now I know that's not true. So uh, can folks on the call clarify, like, why are borrowers hearing about some of these troubles and what does it really mean? And how should a borrower consider applying in the future? And I'm I'm happy to hop on on this one. Um, So for years, unfortunately, the bar the program has rolled out, and it's been rolled out over time, you know, very poorly. Uh, At first, a lot of borrowers were rejected. That's because over the ten years, the, the initial ten years of the program, people didn't know about what they needed to do to qualify. And so the news would report that, you know, 90% of borrowers were rejected for the program. It didn't mean that the program didn't exist. It didn't mean that loan forgiveness isn't real and accessible. It just meant that people didn't know their options. And frankly, there weren't groups like us doing enough of this work at the time to make sure people knew what they needed to do. So that is changing. Uh, More and more people know what they need to do to qualify for public service loan forgiveness. And so I do expect that number is going to decrease quickly. Now, you may have also saw recently a report came out that said there's a backlog of applications. You know, the last administration did not look kindly upon these programs. Uh, There was a lot of hamstrung programs that were supposed to help borrowers that really weren't working the way they were supposed to. So again, with um, new people in control of these programs. I, this is another area that I feel is ripe for change um, and we should see these numbers improve in the coming years. So with all that said, even though many people are being rejected, there are many people who are accessing public service loan forgiveness and that's because it is the law, it is your right and you have the ability to apply if you qualify. So we encourage everyone to qualify because there's opportunities to be denied you can use things like the tool by Savvy, uh, which can help you apply and make sure that you've uh, crossed your T's and dotted your I's and that your application is perfect. So don't be discouraged by those that news. Um, just understand it, but continue to do what you need to do to qualify and apply for the program. All right. Um, 
let's see here. We've got more questions about people's ability to lower their interest on a federal student loan. And I've heard several people talk about refinancing into a private student loan. Um, you know, federal loans don't have a federal refinancing option. So you could, in a way, get a private loan to replace your federal student loan. But that is really risky. So if there's someone on the call that can uh, address why a borrower would maybe be hesitant in switching their loans to a private loan to get a lower interest rate, you know, what are the consequences of doing that? I can jump in. Um, just to re reiterate, you know, what I was talking about on this earlier uh, in the workshop, um, be very cautious about refinancing your federal student loans into private student loans. Private student loans do not have income-driven repayment plans. They are not eligible for any kind of forgiveness. Once you refinance your federal loans into private loans, um, there really is no relief. You know, if you're unemployed, if you have little to no income, you still have to make that payment, uh, which is not really true of federal student loans. You can enroll in an income-driven repayment plan, and it's not perfect, you know, it's not, you know, doesn't necessarily maybe provide the relief that some of us are looking for long-term, but, you know, there's, there's that consumer protection that exists. Um, and in many ways, those protections do not exist for private loans. So for some borrowers, and, and just to speak frankly, for higher income borrowers, especially who really don't need forgiveness or, or are not going to be eligible for forgiveness because of how, how high their income is, they are really the audience for refinance. They actually will stand to benefit from refinancing. But if you're like me and your, your loan balance is big enough and your income is, is more modest, um, it's not going to be the right fit. So, um, you know, the, the, the option exists, but, but think very carefully about, um, about that refinancing process because of some of the things I outlined. Um, I see a borrower here. Jared said that um, they, for years, were told to defer, to, to take a deferment on their student loans just to find out that they could have been enrolled in an income-driven repayment plan all along. Uh, this happens to way too many borrowers. It's easier for your servicer to push you into a deferment, even though it's not the best choice for you. Is there any recourse? Is there something a borrower can do? Um, and if not, you know, what should their next steps be to make sure that they get enrolled in the right program? Hey, Cody, it's, it's Lindsay. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, you know, I, this same thing happened to me and I know Cody, I think it happened to you as well where we didn't really know about income driven repayment plans and we're sort of pushed into a forbearance and then that interest just kept on accruing. Um, so I don't know if you, uh, you know, or the, uh, the rest of the folks at Student Debt Crisis uh, know about any sort of um, ways in which that can be um, or any sort of uh, I guess, lawsuits or anything like that that are ongoing that borrowers can take part of. But I do know as far as getting onto a repayment plan that's manageable, um, for many people and for most people, that's going to be income-driven repayment plans. Um, and as Spencer has, has talked about, um, you know, just recently, uh, the Savvy Tool can help you to do that. Um, if you have any questions about what you might be eligible for, um, you just want to see what your options are, what the lowest monthly payment could be, uh, you can do that through the tool, um, or you can apply through the Department of Education um, website. But I would highly suggest looking at your options under an income-driven repayment plan. Thank you, Lindsay. All right, I'm going to take one more question here, and then we'll close out because I, I, I know it's getting later in the day. We've been addressing so many great questions. Um, uh, now, this is a borrower who... Uh, Name Michelle that wanted to know if you consolidated your student loans in the past, does that automatically mean you don't qualify for public service loan forgiveness? Um, they're confused why their payments are not being counted towards the 120 monthly payments needed to qualify. Uh, 
Um, I can answer. Could you just uh, repeat the first part of the question? Sorry. Yeah, they consolidated their loan and they, they're just curious to know, does that prevent them from qualifying for public service loan forgiveness because their payments aren't counting towards uh, the program for some reason? Mm -hmm. So um, as long as you consolidated your loans into a direct consolidation loan and you're meeting all of the other requirements for PSLF, you should be accruing credits um, you know, on your, on your way to those 120 credits. Um, for that older program that we talked about, the FFEL uh, program, there was a consolidation process under that. So if you had consolidated like maybe 15 years ago or so into a FFL, FFEL consolidation loan, then perhaps that could be why. But generally speaking, as long as you consolidated like in the last 10 years or so, um, you know, you should be accruing those credits, uh, you know, if you're meeting those other eligibility requirements. Um, I, I should take a moment and, and kind of uh, maybe address broader questions. Each individual's circumstance is different. You know, your income is different, your family, your loan types, your work history. That's really what, um, where the value of savvy really comes in, because we can look under the hood see you know what your situation is and then make a recommendation that that's going to put you in the best path forward to save you the most amount of money um and hopefully get you some forgiveness so um you know a lot of these questions can be kind of specific to the individual and that's great uh and that's where the tool comes in and that's where savvy's customer support team student loan experts can come in and help folks on an individual basis because i know we're probably not going to answer all the questions tonight uh, but we'll definitely be able to answer them, you know, if you do sign up and register through Savvy. Great. Well, I, I have to say thank you first to everyone who joined the call today. I know, you know, it's late on the East Coast, it's dinner time here on the West Coast, uh, but this topic is so critically important. Um, and also thank you uh, to our allies and our partners from Next Gen Policy, from Savvy and Young Invincibles, um, you know, with with a coalition of, of individuals committed to helping borrowers, we really can reach everybody who needs this information. So thank you as well. Uh, with that, everyone, good night. Uh, and thank you again for joining us.